those types of things, if we can help our patients through that, I think that they'll be happier in the end if we help them through the whole health initiative. Welcome to the Learn Skin Podcast with me, Dr. Raja. And me, Dr. Hadar, where we discuss all things skin. Join us as we delve into the art and science of skin health in today's episode. Hey, Raja, can you say the thing I told you to tell them? Of course. We are board-certified dermatologists. This podcast is meant for educational and informational purposes only and is not considered medical advice, nor does it serve as a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. All opinions shared do not express the views of Learn Health, Inc. Let's get to the good stuff. Hey, Raja, how are you today? Hey, Hadar, what's going on? You know, I don't know. I think I want to talk about acne, and I'll just go ahead and say it. Acne is still one of the number one diseases that we see in clinic. Patients are concerned about it. Parents are concerned about it. Significant others are concerned about their acne of their significant other. So it's just everybody wants to talk about acne. And it seems like in dermatology, we've been talking about it forever. But guess what? If you bring the right expert, you can always learn something new. That's right. Yeah. And you know, the thing about acne is it's got a distinction of being non-cystic. The FDA has even put it in as uh, it's found in the healthy population. So prevalent. So, but we need some help with this. So we've got Dr. Jeanette Carey. She's a faculty member at the University of Miami. You know a little bit about that, right, Hadar? You've, you've been I to heard that, of that place. I heard about it. Yeah, exactly. And she's also the dermatology service chief at the VA. So, Jeanette, we're really excited to have you teach us something new about acne. And I know you do a lot of work with rosacea, too. And maybe we'll peek a little bit into there, too. Sure. Thank you both for inviting me tonight. I'm excited to talk about acne, and I'll give you a few pearls that I use in my practice. I want to talk a little bit about diet and nutrition because we are working towards a whole health initiative in dermatology. So in my mind, I'll throw out some little pearls that I know. You've probably read the articles because I know how well read both of you are. But would you like to start with diet and acne and I'll give you my pearls? I say let's jump in face first. Let's do it. And you know, Jeanette, I want to start before we get to the pearls. I want to ask you, why is this coming up in clinic? Why do you think patients keep asking about it? Because you've been doing this for a minute or two, as the young people say, and you kind of got this perspective. I think always people want to know about diet, but it seems that more and more this becomes the mainstream kind of thinking where it used to not be like that, right? Well, yes, you're right. I think that people talk about it more simply because of the access to information, whether it be correct information or incorrect information. My young teenage patients and young adults, there is some data to suggest that an 18 to 24 year old patient who you see is more likely to listen to what they read, and this is gonna date me now, online, um, versus what the doctor is saying to them in front of them. So whether it be social media, or whether it be a blog that they're reading, or some other form of information that they're getting, they are bombarded with information about diet and acne. And not much of it is coming from medical articles, the medical literature. If you look up diet and acne, you'll find some things for sure, but try to find good, well-controlled studies and you'll see there aren't as many as we would like. So that's why I believe young people are asking so much about acne. They're getting information from many sources And our goal is to sort of set them straight on what we know to date and then also listen to them because sometimes they're going to give us a clue of something that we hadn't thought of, whether it be, you know, supplementations that they're taking that are making their acne worse that hit them way before they hit us. So we have to listen to them too. You know, I I love so much of what you said because listening is a key thing to what we do. And another key thing to the modern doctor, I think, and for years to come will be to help patients sort through the information. So we're less and less becoming the providers of diagnosis or what are the mainstay of therapy, but really uh, what we're doing is helping sort through the evidence, kind of try to put a framework of thinking for the patients about how to manage their diseases. So let's talk about some of the evidence we have and what are your favorite things to talk about with patients about diet when it comes to their acne? So One of the things I think about with diet is what can people do easily? What will they stick to? And the easiest thing as I prepared for speaking with you all tonight is to think about what they drink. 
There are some very good studies out there, but the best one comes from China. And it's a year or two, maybe three years ago. And it looked at sugar consumption in drinks in men. They couldn't do it in women's because of menstrual cycles. And what they found is that if you took more than 100 grams of sugar in a drink during the day, you were more likely as a young man to have moderate to severe acne. So I'm not saying that sugar causes acne in everybody. I'm saying that in some people, sugar can aggravate acne. So as I was at the grocery store tonight also, I looked and I said, how can people do that? And what are the things, is there anything that I'm telling them that I could do differently? And what I'd like to start with is water. They should substitute out a drink for water if they don't like plain water. I like a lot of unsweetened iced tea. It's inexpensive. I use water from the tap with a purifier attached to my tap, and then I make some iced tea. So I look at drinks as the easiest place to start to lower our sugar consumption. Secondly, the second easy thing, sometimes with respect to telling patients, but not so easy to carry through, is I tell them to get rid of the white stuff, the white bread, the white rice, the white pasta, the bagels, the donuts, everything that I said above, I love. So I can say it's difficult to get rid of these things, but try to swap some of them out. But I start with the drinks first, because that's an easy one. Once you've made that commitment, you'll get rid of a fair amount of sugar. And we know that probably a high glycemic load has the best evidence for a causal factor for acne. You know, I love the point that you made about unsweetened teas because there was a study in Asia, it was a big one, and they were looking at sodas and they found an association with sodas. But then as part of the study, they found an association with sweetened teas. And I know that these are just so widely available everywhere to get these sweetened teas. So appreciate the point on that. Now, you did say white stuff, and I noticed that you left out one of the things because it's not necessarily about glycemic index. And I'm really curious to get your take on milk. What is your take on dairy? (laughs) Yeah, the milk controversy lives on. So initially, I'm sure you all know this, but we'll repeat it. The data was done as a retrospective study with women about my age in their 50s, looking back to see what they had in high school. And it was um, it was the nurses survey out of uh, Massachusetts. And they found that if women took milk, they were more likely to have acne, specifically the skim milk. They looked at the sons of these women in a second study. So their male offspring and found it to hold true. People started looking around at milk and trying to figure out what is with milk? Why is skim milk worse than whole milk? And then they felt that there was a protective factor in the fat component And that held true for a couple of years, and we were calling skim milk the bad guy. But then recently, there was a study, I believe out of Iceland, but it's out of one of the northern countries towards Europe, and I can't remember which one, and I'll have to bring that for my talk. But they found that maybe skim milk isn't so bad. So now we're back to the drawing board, because for years, I told my patients, if you're going to have milk, stay away from skim milk, but now that seems to be changing. So how I explain the milk controversy to my patients, I say first they must have some calcium intake, especially young kids. You can't tell them to go no milk and no dairy without calcium supplementation. And then the second thing I tell them is I would not discontinue milk. I would say to see if milk really triggers your acne. If you really feel that way, then I would get your calcium from other sources. But I, in general, I do not tend to limit milk. And I'd be interested to hear what you all think, but I am not a proponent of stopping people from drinking milk, if that makes sense. Well, no, I appreciate your perspective on this. You know, just looking across the evidence, and we've done a lot of basic science work, the whey protein, the oligosaccharides, the beta casein, the alpha casein, they all stimulate the sebaceous glands. So, you know, my take is I unilaterally take everybody off milk because now for calcium supplementation, they do have fortification and oat milk and whatnot. Uh, I mean, I think your point is a good one, though. You know, the evidence is still, you know, the hard evidence is still mixed in some of these studies. But I've just seen how much whey has an impact. So for that reason, I am pulling people off milk. None of my patients care about it. They all come off the milk. But I don't know if you've had challenges with that. So, Roger, and I'm going to ask you, so which type of milk you do recommend anything but dairy so the thing with skim milk we work with food scientists here and what they have told us is that when they pull the fat out they actually have to put a filler in most of the states have to do this the filler is full of whey and oligosaccharides which are both stimulatory to the igf1 insulin pathway so 
you know, I wonder if that might be contributing too, Jeanette. There, maybe there's something else that we're putting into the skim milk that we just didn't realize. You know, I, I don't know. You know, I think we need more studies there. And I do like your general comment on white stuff or the high glycemic diet. And that is a, such a important general principle in medicine because it's an easy recommendation to make, right? I don't need necessarily the evidence on acne per se to just say, hey, you know, this may be healthy for you overall because we know that we have obesity epidemic. We tend to take way too much carbs than we're supposed to or just uh, just really, really load up the glycemic index, kind of really shoot it up on just a normal meal in our bad diet. So anyway, so that's or our sad diet, I should say. And so that's such an easy recommendation to make. Yes, and I do tell patients not to use whey supplementation. So for my bodybuilding patients, a lot of the young men like to bulk up with whey. I tell them, excuse me, it sounds a little goofy, but no whey. So no whey for them. So I do do the whey. No whey. So so that's known in my clinic. I guess I'm probably a little sensitive, Raja, and I understand what you're saying about the other types of milk. I'm probably a little sensitive, and maybe you can answer this, How much do those other milks cost? Sometimes I think, you know, yeah, just wondering, are they more expensive? Because I drink good old regular milk. Yeah, no, it's it's a good point. I think if you're looking at it from a financial standpoint, there could be some financial burden depending on where you're able to get them. Although I will say now, and maybe this is a California thing, they're putting it up to be very competitive with the standard dairy milk right next to them on the shelf for some of them. But I think the cheaper one is almond milk because they make in such bulk. But I do have to say almond milk doesn't have too many almonds in it. It's mostly just, I think, water. And then there's a few almonds in there. So, I mean, I think that's a fair point too, you know, in terms of the economics of things. So you have to think about that aspect of things too. And if we don't talk about this, if we're not trying to figure it out, and which is what we're trying to do tonight, if we're not trying to figure it out, then again, how will our patients navigate through all this? right? So this is why we're talking about it. We get our different people's opinions. We figure out what's good for our patient population, and then we make recommendations. So I think it's fantastic to hear what you're doing. Right. And we are actually practicing, I think, Jeanette and I, in a food desert. And I know I drive from the hospital where I work, and I try to find just a simple grocery store that will sell fresh vegetables. And I need to drive a few miles to get to that point. And so uh, our patients may not have that choice. So thank you so much for bringing that up, because I think it is important that, you know, as physicians, we're in a position where we can try to advocate for our patients and suggest, hey, we need other options. And speaking of new options, I want to switch gears because I don't want to run out of time. I do want to talk to you, Jeanette, about new topicals for acne. And, you know, it seems like it's been such a long time since we had something new and now we have a whole slew of them. So tell us what's new, what's hot in topical therapy for acne. So I think the one that we're all waiting to come out is the new topical antiandrogen called Clascoterone. And it's approved for the ages 12 and up. So we have something that we can use in our pre-adolescent patients or pubescent patients. It seems to work well. I thought it would work better than it does. I think I was thinking it was going to be the cure-all, but as we learn more and more about acne, we learn how multifactorial the development of that little pimple is. So I'm excited about Clascoterone. It was FDA approved, but I haven't seen it released yet. I will try to reach out to the company before the October meeting to see where what the holdup is, but it has been FDA approved for the ages of 12 and up. There are some new formulations of old retinoids, which I think you guys have all heard about in different lotions and potions, I should say. And then there is also a new topical retinoid called triferritine. It has been around now for probably a year and a half. We've had it to be able to use. And the thing I like about triferritine is it seems to kick in a little bit more quickly than other retinoids. The irritancy potential by the company is probably supposed to be a little less, but it still does cause a little bit of irritation. So it's a retinoid, so treat it as such. Antibiotic-wise, we have different forms. They've been around a while. You may have seen minocycline in a foam form. As far as the other topicals, I think my most the one I'm most excited about, because I haven't seen it yet, is the Clascoterone, the topical antiandrogen. And I will talk about that at my session in October. So where do you see Clascoterone coming in? How would you incorporate that into your regimens? Would you use it pretty close to first line or any certain sort of acne subsets? 
Well, of course, that adult female patient is going to be the first set of people that I try it on. But, you know, it's a proof for ages 12 and up in men and women or males and females. So I'm going to, at the beginning, I'm going to probably try it on my adult females, but whoever can get it at the beginning would be who I would be trying it on. I might might also try it on the very oily skin patient to see how that works for them, to see if we can find something that really does something you put on the skin and you can actually see less oil, something similar to you know, not to the extent by any means, but something similar to what you get with isotretinoin or even with spironolactone, you get some decrease in sebum production. So I'm going to use it in everybody. I'm not going to be afraid in, you know, young men or young women, but I think the first people that my patients are actually waiting for this, my adult female patients, they're like, when is that stuff coming out? When can I use that? So that's who I envision it working on. But as to how I would use it in the regimen, I'd probably, you know, maybe substitute it, maybe use a retinoid in the evening and the clascoterone in the morning. I'm going to play with it a little bit and see. You know, I like your point. I actually prescribed it not too long ago. And then the pharmacy let me know that, hey, it's still not available. And so yeah, I'm just like you. I'm waiting with bated breath to have it available on the market so we can start prescribing. And I'm actually curious to see how it's going to play out in other conditions like uh, hydronitis separativa. It may have a role there as well. You're very smart to say that. If it, mm. it could help our hydronitis patients, that would be fantastic. I believe it's in studies also for hair loss too. So we'll see about that, how it works. But if it would help, it would be great. And maybe the first of many anti-androgens. All right. So I wanted to switch gears and talk to you about, you mentioned a whole health initiative. How does that apply in your acne patient? What's new there? So as far as whole health, that term I learned first at the VA. So congratulations to the VA because they have a whole health initiative, which they started at our VA, well, maybe about two years ago now. And in my understanding of whole health is not only what you eat, it's how you spend your day, some time for relaxation, some time for self-care, even things like, you know, we could talk about acupuncture and hypnosis. Um, I will say at the VA in Miami, I'm very proud to say we do have an acupuncture clinic for some chronic pain issues, but in general, just making the patient feel good in an all around way. Now there is a very good, it's an older book by Richard Freed. He's a dermatologist and a psychologist out of Pennsylvania, and he talks about adult acne. And I recommend that. So I think 2007, but I still recommend that to my patients because it it's sort of like an early whole health mantra, basically. And in that book, he takes a circle and he divides it up into a pie and he has people put down, you know, the things that they're concerned about so that and where acne fits in and all these different things. So he has them starting to think about the whole picture. So can we use these things for acne? Sure. People have used acupuncture I have used hypnosis with good success in a few patients for acne excoriae. I believe in in stress reduction, whether it be exercise, whether it be meditation. So whole health in my mind, and I hope you guys agree, and I'm sure you guys are way ahead of me on this anyhow, but I would hope that you would agree. It's not just what we eat and not just the medicines we put on, but it's trying to get us to feel better for the whole body. We know that stress is a true aggravator of acne. And the best examples of stress causing acne are with exam stress. It's, it's a way to quantify stress. Yeah, it's really hard to quantify stress otherwise. But exam stress, there are probably two articles in the literature that show with true exam stress, you get worsening of acne. So those types of things, if we can help our patients through that, I think that they'll be happier or in the end if we help them through the whole health initiative. I haven't done any mindfulness with my patients. I I know that some people have done that with hydradenitis and things like that. I have not gone that far, but I'd be anxious to hear what you go, you all have done with respect to whole health. My gosh. And the stuff that you're doing out there, Jeanette, is just fascinating to me. I mean, at the VA, it seems like you really are incorporating a lot of different modalities. You know, I'm really curious to hear about this hypnosis with acne excoriae because I know that I struggle with this one personally. And where did you get your hypnosis training and how have you incorporated that in? Yeah, it's it's not me. I work with a psychologist. Oh, I see. And I will tell you that, uh, yeah, and it is the psychologist does inflammatory bowel disease, acne excoriae. Um, she did things like that, and she got wonderful results. 
I did not do the hypnosis myself. I do not know how to hypnotize anybody. If I could, that would be fantastic. I would do it at faculty meeting, Hadar, and I would hypnotize <laughs> the group. Um, but And he knows Sounds what I'm talking great. about. Yeah, he oh, knows what no. you, you, you know, and I've been to enough faculty meetings where I would fly you out for grand rounds and have you stay as a resident to hypnotize us too. <laughs> but hypnosis done with the right psychologist is very, very effective. And I don't know, if, you know, they, my patients would go about once a week, once every other week, depending on what their insurance would cover or what was, what they could afford. I don't know if it is the meeting with the psychologist also that helps, but it will help if you can find the right psychologist to do it. And they are specially trained, at least in the state of Florida, they are specially trained. And how I found my... That's wonderful. And I think one of our goals is to create a community where we have these discussions and share these experiences, because ultimately we would like to produce high level evidence on, on these very topics that we see anecdotally in clinic working well for a subset of our patients and would love to uh, have robust evidence. So when next time when you come on, Jeanette, you, you can say, and there are two papers on hypnosis and acne where they took, you know, hundreds of patients and, and did that. And that's what our goal is here, not just with this podcast, but the entire community. And of course, with the Integrative Dermatology Symposium, where Jeanette will be speaking and you can pick her brain at your leisure because she's going to be there available to answer all questions about acne and much more because she's not just a wonderful acne expert. She's a brilliant dermatologist. Uh, so I want to thank you for your time, for your expertise. I can't wait for your talk as usual. Every time Jeanette speaks, I kind of put in my calendar with a little sticker to remember, okay, that's a talk you want to listen to. So thank you so much for joining us yet again. Thank you guys for the opportunity. I'll see you in October. Hey, Raja, what are you doing this October 22nd through the 24th? There's only one right answer to that question. The fourth annual Integrative Dermatology Symposium. Of course. Now, a question. Are you going to travel all the way to Sacramento, California to meet me in person? Or are you going to join virtually in your pajamas? Pajamas in person? Well, you might see me in pajamas at the Sheraton Grand in person in Sacramento. <laughs> or maybe I'll be in a Jolly Folly costume. Who knows? But I'm excited to chair this hybrid, one-of-a-kind conference with you, Hadar. Well, you know, man, I do love this unique event our team just put together. This is an event that really takes an integrative approach to common patient questions, also an integrative approach to challenging dermatology diseases. We also are going to cover aesthetics and have practical takeaways to start using in the clinic right away just when you come back. So, you know, this is the kind of information I just can't find with any other meeting. So true. And the good news is it's not just for us. It's for practitioners of all backgrounds and everyone is welcome. Use our discount code IDS25 at checkout for 25% off registration. And you can find us at www.integrativedermatologysymposium.com. Come say hi and tag us on social if you'll be there. And our tag is at Integrative Derm Symposium. We hope to see you there.